original thing was supposed to be under a societal seat. With a sledgehammer. <laughs> no, I mean, clearly that's an enormous uh, question. As I said, I'm a poor old psychoanalyst that can only deal with people one at a time. But certainly for Barack Obama and uh, Boehner, whatever his name is, uh, a major job is thinking not how to win 2012, but to stay alive in 2020. And that takes a long-range view. Yes? This is a little bit narrow, but um, have you done any, is there any data on whether people on the autistic spectrum can develop these empathic, mature defenses? Oh, I mean, this is a terribly good question. In the limbic system is a part of the brain called the insula, which nobody knows about and nobody talks about. And in the insula are mirror cells, which organically allow us to empathize, to experience other people's pain as real, but know it's not us which is terribly important in nurses and psychologists and social workers and absolutely impossible for mothers. <laughs> and and, and the, the one theory is that autistic children uh, have too few mirror cells, so that although there's wonderful stories like Temple Grandin, when you have uh, a meal with Temple, which I had the experience of asking her how to be helpful to an autistic child. She was only could talk about Temple Grandin and why the World Trade Center collapsed. So that uh, whereas schizophrenics and adolescents and heroin addicts and alcoholics and personality disorders get better with time, uh, probably uh, Asperger's learn to deal with their problems the same way someone with cerebral palsy at 50 is more adept at getting around than they were at uh, 10. But it's, it's learning survival strategies. They know that they cannot, uh, as my eight-year-old granddaughter says, picture. And unlike positive psychology, says picturing is the key to happiness. And when her mother said, well, what does picturing mean? She says, you know, understanding how other people feel. Uh, so eight-year-olds can be pretty wise, too. Uh, May I ask you about, uh, I was going to ask you about happiness. Part of your book opened about it this morning. Uh, and it's called The Star is Happiness. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that you would talk about happiness. I was going to ask you that question because I know that you have written about it and spoken about it, and you just mentioned happiness. Could you elaborate some on that word that uh, rushes around America? You betcha. Desperately looking for it? Happiness is love, full stop. that if you pay attention, as I'm blessed with the grant study, to people who are happy between 80 and 90, they're the people who had the most loving childhoods and used the most empathic defenses before 30. In other words, happiness is as much, forgive the word, bullshit, as Fred Astaire tap dancing up Fifth Avenue saying to Judy Garland, happy Easter. And if you translate happiness, another bumper sticker, happiness is drive reduction, joy is connection. And so that the apostles having lost their best friend but at least seen him again, went back to Jerusalem on Easter feeling great joy. 
They weren't tap dancing. And, and so that the problem with happiness and contentment, these are all, I mean, psychologists like scales. So they write down scales. And if I ask you how happy you are on a one to seven scale, you're up in your head, in your cortex. Whereas if you're my eight-year-old granddaughter coming home from a funeral, she writes happiness is joy, hope, love, you've got it. It's those things that live in the limbic system. And the limbic system doesn't get happy. The limbic system makes us different from dinosaurs because it was put there to connect. And so that Jack Rowe, in writing his bestseller on aging, has as an epigraph, only connect. And I would simply add to it, Forster's uh, only connect, the prose and the passion, and both will be exalted. In other words, you can't, you know, positive psychology um, is a lot more successful and sells a lot more books than I do. So you need the <laughs> cognitive stuff in there to uh, hold your audience. But it's, it's not what uh, <laughs> happiness is about, it's, it's connection. George, I think we have time for one more uh, question. So, Peter, do you want to? Thank you. You've mentioned your grandchildren several times. Um, what advice do you have, based on your personal relationships, your research, to, I think, building on Rick's question, helping younger generations to learn what we know about aging and to uh, and accelerate the process by which we can bring this generation into the kind of wisdom that you're describing? You don't tell, you show. Your Adam man dying of prostatic cancer feeling lots of fatigue and lots of joy, saying to a young, wet behind the ears, 60 year old, this is the most happiest time of my life. You've got a show, you can't tell. <laughs>